organizers to give me this opportunity as a social scientist to present here today uh, from some research we did last year, a qualitative study about uh, the perspectives of HIV service providers and clients about treatment as prevention in Swaziland. So I'm working as a medical anthropologist in the MEXART program, which stands for Maximizing ART for Better Health and Zero New Infections. The MEXART program is carried out by a multi-stakeholder consortium whose overall goal is to increase the uptake of HIV testing, improve access to care, and reduce loss to follow up in Swaziland. This is done through a wide range of activities, um, both at the level of the health system strengthening by, for example, training nurses to initiate ART at community clinics, the procurement of CD4 um, point of care machines, and at community level by training traditional healers and community health workers to function as role models to mobilize the community to test for HIV uh, early, just to mention a few of them activities. Furthermore, we have a group of social science researchers um, who are doing ethnographic research to analyze the social, cultural, and other stru structural barriers affecting the HIV epidemic in Swaziland um, in order to inform HIV interventions and to analyze its effects on the target population. So this year, MaxArt will start with uh, the second phase in which the consortium will study the feasibility, acceptability, cost-effectiveness, and clinical outcomes of providing ART for all clients diagnosed HIV positive, irrespective of CD4 count. Prior to the start of that, um, we as medical anthropologists at the University of Amsterdam, in collaboration with the Swaziland National Network of People Living with HIV, SWANEPA, carried out a qualitative uh, situational analysis in eight health facilities. And these facilities were selected uh, to be included in the treatment as prevention intervention study. And our aim was to map context specific barriers to initiate clients early on ART, and for example, to look at adherence support or the lack thereof, mm -hmm. and to talk to HIV service providers and people living with HIV about their perceptions and opinions on treatment as prevention. So we did that uh, over a period of three months last year, between April and June 2013, in two different regions in Swaziland. We carried out semi-structured interviews with 71 service providers, which included doctors, nurses, uh, counselors, expert clients, wide range. Um, you can read through some of the other uh, methods, but we spent four weeks in each facility for observing the patient's trajectory into HIV care, whereby we observed pre- and post-test counseling session, uh, as well as pre-art counseling and adherence counseling, um, to understand what kind of messages people were given and to understand where there might be gaps. And in, ad in addition, we did some focus group discussions with people living with HIV uh, who were part of support groups and also talked to community health workers, of which you see that picture up there. So for this presentation, I want to zoom in on some of our data around what we believe will be factors relating TASP communication, and we think are affecting TASP interventions when they are implemented in, in real life, in practice. So three of those, which I'll be talking about today, are institutional dynamics of provider-client interactions, uh, moral opinions of HIV service providers, and previous health campaigns. So instead of going into detail about Swaziland um, and national statistics, since we've already heard from Dr. Alcalo from the National AIDS Program, for those of you who were here yesterday, uh, I instead thought I would start with a short story narrated by a nurse to me, which will illustrate my first point around the institutional care dynamics. So reflecting on the ways in which providers assess readiness to start art, a nurse who works in a regional hospital told me, and I quote, we had a client some time back, because a nurse would tell, because a nurse, um, because nurses would tell her it's good for you to start ART. She ended up giving in, saying, "Okay, fine, I'll start the treatment." She took treatment, but never swallowed the tablets. On the review days, she would come, and she was very clever. She would count. She would have gone for maybe 28 days. Then she would take out 28 tablets from the container and come with the remaining ones. If you check the pill count. Mm -hmm. Um, if you check the pill count, it was always 100%. And then we say, very well, mama, you're taking your tablets very well. That continued for some time until she didn't get any better. Because obviously, if you're not taking the treatment, you won't get any better. She believed in this other traditional treatment called Moringa. So she told us about it, that she was actually taking Moringa instead of taking the ARVs. So finally, she came with a plastic bag full of 
uh, medicine. She didn't destroy them, she was just putting them aside. She said, okay, here are your pills. Can we please start afresh? Now I'm ready to start the treatment. So he said, I think because sometimes we really want to put people on art, sometimes we overlook the point that is this patient really ready to start treatment. So this story uh, illustrates that how we are confronted with an institutional culture in which clients, at least in the rural areas in Swaziland, don't usually question the provider's advice or don't ask questions, uh, though it does not mean that they actually follow up this advice. Mm. So we also talked to some clients. Um, there were only 34, so by no means it's a generalized picture, but we talked to them. All these clients were people who are not yet on art. And we talked to them about what if you would offer to start treatment, would you accept it and what are your motivations? And um, quite interestingly, interestingly, some providers said, which illustrates also the power imbalances between clients and providers, that they would do so if the provider tells them. Another interesting finding was that some said they wished to start ART early in order not to be seen falling sick, as they were fearful of the stigma that falling sick carries. So this last point goes perhaps a bit against the presum presumption sometimes made that TASP will normalize HIV or destigmatize because everybody would now be starting on treatment. And I think it's, it should be an empir empirical question that we look at how treatment as prevention may or may not affect stigma and disclosure. One of the questions we asked healthcare providers in our interviews was whether they felt that clients should be told about the prevention benefit of ART. 68% responded yes. But then when we probed a bit further and asked these providers how would they, in their words, explain um, the benefits uh, of early ART, hardly no one mentioned prevention benefits. For example, a doctor who responded yes to this question, he said, they don't understand the word prevention. You remove it from your talk. You say, no, we try to destroy the most we can of the virus from your body to, for you to live nicely. They don't understand that word. That is scientific language of researchers. And in a similar fashion, a nurse argued, personally, I think that is nice information to have for the health worker, not for the clients. Because you know what people do? They will tell themselves, I'm not infectious, and they will be spreading the HIV. The fears that providers had about talking about treatment as a potential form of prevention or an additional benefit uh, for prevention was that clients would misinterpret the message that ARVs may reduce the risk of transmission to mean zero risk and that this would lead, this would lead to an increase in sex without condoms and promiscuity. They also feared being blamed as providers for any infections that may still occur after having mentioned the prevention benefit that starting arts could have for a sexual partner. So, what we found was that these fears amongst providers and also amongst policymakers in Swaziland were influenced by previous health campaigns, in particular the nationwide mill circumcision campaign that was implemented in 2011. This campaign reached even the remotest places in the country with roadside paintings on shops and houses, as one of them you can see in this picture. Nevertheless, the campaign fell short of reaching its goal of circumcising 80% of the Swazi male population and only around 20% of Swazi men um, had been circumcised. The campaign advocated male circumcision as primarily a method of HIV prevention and focused on the risk reduction that circumc circumcision may provide. As you can read on the picture, that is, if you can read the Swazi, it says, I am safe. I know I did it right. Safer from HIV. According to a qualitative study carried out by my colleague Alfred Adams from the University of Amsterdam, he tried to understand why Swazi men did not go for circumcision. And one of his uh, findings was that the slogan brand, you can see it on the top left, Sokan Mobe, which is translated as circumcise and conquer, had the unintended effect that circumcision became seen as a substitute for condom use by some. Mm -hmm. And the choice of the word in conquering originally meant to say um, conquer your fears and then get circumcised was understood by some as meaning to acquire more sexual partners. So to, when you're circumcised, you can conquer more women. Also, it led some women to believe that they would be protected from HIV if their partner was circumcised. Thus, it may therefore be not so surprising that health providers are skeptical about talking to treatment as prevention and particularly using that term after they had, heard, had to work hard to counter people's beliefs around circumcision preventing men and women from acquiring HIV. Instead, providers prefer to not to focus on the prevention benefits of ARVs, 
but rather frame it in terms of individual health benefits. But they were also unsure about what exactly these health benefits were for clients who have very high CD4 counts. So MaxArt is working at the moment on pretesting some of the messages around treatment as prevention, and maybe if some of you have already seen it, my colleague Emma Mafara has a poster up about that, so you can uh, talk to her if you're interested in learning more. So the mill circumcision um, campaign is still uh, is still fresh in the memory of the, um, the clients and providers and was quoted as often as an example of mixed messaging and it explains a bit of the tension there exists now in Swaziland about getting the message right. So from our observations with clients and, uh, and interviews we found that there are some other gaps in information and mixed messages. Um, one example I, I want to give, and this is the last slide, um, in addition, um, an example of a mixed message was that um, clients are told by providers that if they are not using ARVs consistently, that they might, uh, or they might, or they will um, develop resistance. And this, this is a very strong belief in Swaziland that if you are not adhering well, you will develop um, resistance. And therefore, clients, some clients were saying that only when the partner is starting on art, that is when they want to use condoms because they fear that if they then have sex with a person who has become resistant to the strain of the ARVs that they're themselves using, that that's the one that they will then transmit to the other person and that the ARVs won't work for them anymore. So in conclusion, our findings revealed that current HIV prevention messages, institutional cultures of HIV service provision, and providers' opinions affect the potential effectiveness of a TASP strategy. Far from being tacitly compliant with the move towards TASPs, our findings demonstrate ethical challenges faced by frontline service providers who feel uneasy talking about the prevention benefits of art. So we feel it's important to monitor what kind of messages are revealed to clients and spreading in the community and what kind of in unintended consequences they may have. So finally, we feel anthropological research, that is long-term research in communities, can contribute to studying how treatment as prevention affects changes in counseling practices and perceptions of HIV prevention and treatment by studying from within, within the facilities or within the communities, how TASP is implemented in practice and what kind of unintended effects it may have. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Eva. The, the next speaker is Lian Ping T from, uh, I think, from the center here. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. So I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me here to speak about my research. And I'd also like to acknowledge my co-authors who are listed here. As you all are well aware, um, people who use illicit drugs are vulnerable to a range of health harms and consequently leads to the over-reliance on emergency rooms and acute hospital awards for their regular source of care. Studies in Vancouver, Canada, and elsewhere have demonstrated common causes of morbidity and mortality among these individuals, and they include um, AIDS-related illnesses, overdose, soft tissue infections such as abscesses, cellulitis, or endocarditis that arise from injection drug use. Leaving hospital against medical advice is a huge concern among the uh, drug using population and studies have shown that approximately 25% of people who inject drugs leave hospital against medical advice. Um, these studies also show that uh, IDU are two to four times more likely to leave hospital AMA compared to their non-IDU counterparts. And there are a host of negative consequences associated with leaving hospital against medical advice. And studies such as the one that um, is up here by Southern and colleagues conducted in New York um, demonstrated that patients who leave against medical advice are at higher risk of mortality as well as readmission. Um, and as a result leads to a high financial burden on the healthcare system. The Dr. Peter Center is an HIV-AIDS-focused 
integrated health program that provides support to some of Vancouver's most vulnerable citizens who face issues such as poverty, homelessness, and mental health and addi addiction in addition to HIV AIDS. Um, employing a specific model of care, which includes a strong harm reduction component, the Dr. Peter Center program goals are improved adherence to HIV treatment and improved um, health overall. Uh, the Dr. Peter Center provides three core programs. First, the day health program, um, a 24-hour specialized nursing care residence, and um, an enhanced supporting housing system. The objective of the present study was to assess the impact of the Dr. Peter Center on leaving hospital against medical advice among HIV positive illicit drug users. The AIDS care cohort to evaluate exposure to survival services, called ACCESS in short, is an ongoing open prospective cohort study of HIV positive illicit drug users. Um, these individuals were recruited through community outreach and word of mouth. And in order to be eligible for the study, they had to be HIV positive, be at least 18 years old, use illicit drugs other than cannabinoids in the previous month, and provide informed consent. Um, every six months, they complete an interviewer-administered questionnaire um, that includes information such as behavioral drug use patterns, as well as access to um, health and harm reduction services, and they also provide blood samples for serologic analyses. So we linked the ACCESS cohort data to two external databases. First, the drug treatment program of the BC Center for Excellence in HIV AIDS, which where we obtained their ART dispensation records, as well as their um, clinical information, such as their CD4 counts and HIV RNA patterns. We also linked our data to St. Paul's Hospital, where we obtained information on discharge status among those who were hospitalized there. So the study we restricted to July 2005 and 2011, and our study sample were restricted to participants who experienced at least one hospitalization at St. Paul's Hospital. Our main outcome measure of interest was discharge from hospital against medical advice and was derived from the St. Paul's Hospital Discharge Database. We defined this as either a code six, meaning you left against medical advice or signed out and were absent without leave, or a code 12, meaning that um, you had a pass to leave the hospital but just not, didn't return from that. Um, our main explanatory variable was being a participant at the Dr. Peter Center. We conducted bivariable and multivariable GE to estimate the effect between the main explanatory variable of interest, so being a participant at the Dr. Peter Center, and our outcome, which was discharge from hospital against medical advice. And we adjusted for a range of demographic, behavioral, and clinical confounders. Um, all secondary explanatory variables were considered confounding a priori and were therefore included in the final model regardless of its statistical significance. So in total, there were 181 participants in our study. About 40% of them left against hospital, left hospital against medical advice at least once during the study period, so a higher proportion than previously noted studies. And approximately a quarter of patients were participants of the Dr. Peter Center. There were 45% of our sample were female. Um, we followed these individuals up for a total of 203 person years, and um, they each contributed between one to 10 observations in our study. So in an unadjusted model, we found that the odds of discharging from hospital against medical advice were 0 0.43 times, I mean, among those who were participants of the Dr. Peter Center compared to those who were not, and this was a statistically significant finding. Um, in an adjusted model, after adjusting for a range of clinical, behavioral, and demographic factors, we still uh, found this relationship to be persistent. So our findings are consistent with previous studies that have described hospitals as risk environments that ultimately increase the likelihood of leaving AMA among 
illicit drug users. Um, and s some reasons that have been noted for this include the fact that hospitals operate under abstinence-only drug policies in general, and as well as stigma, discrimination, and cultural stereotypes that ultimately um, increase the uncomfortable experiences uh, that IDU have within hospital settings, and um, also the possibility of inadequate pain management um, for these individuals. So given our findings, an HIV AIDS integrated health program in proximity to a hospital may minimize the vulnerability to harms associated with leaving against medical advice. Some recommendations from our findings include the need to implement comprehensive harm reduction approaches in or in proximity to hospital settings, um, such services like needle syringe distribution programs, a supervised drug consumption facility, and adequate and knowledgeable methadone dosing. Um, and these are all offered at the Dr. Peter Center. Also, there's a need for education and training programs for improving cultural competency among healthcare providers. And lastly, um, the provision of proper pain management for illicit drug users within hospitals. Um, as with all studies, there are some limitations to ours. First, um, our study is not a random sample of illicit drug users and therefore is not rep may not be representative or generalizable to other drug using populations. Our cohort data is subject to reporting biases such as social desirability reporting or uh, recall bias, although it's important to note that our outcome measure of discharge AMA is a, a hard measure um, measured through administrative data sources, so would not likely be subject to these types of biases. And lastly, there may be some unmeasured confounding present given the nature of cohort studies. So in conclusion, an HIV AIDS integrated health program in proximity to hospitals may curb the rate of leaving hospital prematurely and the development of similar programs in other settings may minimize the high AMA related human and fiscal costs. I'd like to end by acknowledging the participants of our study as well as our uh, funders and academic partners. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Jorge from uh, AIDS Healthcare Foundation, Mexico. Uh, thank you. And this time I promise not to grab the audience microphone to ask questions. <laughs> so um, first, uh, kind of uh, promotional, AIDS, AIDS Healthcare Foundation is an international organization based in the US, but right now we are working at directly or in partnership uh, in 32 countries. We have almost 103,000 uh, patients in HIV care. We are performing around 2 million rapid HIV tests every year, including the Guinness World Record on the largest number of rapid HIV tests done in one single day in one single city that was Rosario, Argentina in 2012. And that's a poster that you can also see uh, at the posters uh, section. So now going back with uh, our work uh, together with uh, Mexico, especially with the Mexican AIDS program, um, we have some information that we started to get in order to estimate the, the Mexican cascade of care. So despite universal access to ART in Mexico has already, has uh, nearly 5,008 deaths each year, which is 4.5 4 per 100,000 in 2012. This high mortality could be explained by many factors, including HIV testing and engagement in care. However, we cannot consider all Mexico homogeneous, and that's why after developing the first national HIV care cascade, we started estimating cascades for each one of the 32 states or provinces that Mexico has. But uh, most of the health system in Mexico is highly decentralized to state level. Uh, so HIV, HIV treatment, which is a national policy, policy, nevertheless, the local decision makers decide on testing, linkage to care, adherence, campaigns, etc. Uh, people who are living with HIV who know their status and proportions with undetectable viral load can vary widely. 
uh, comparing countries and states' cascades can be, we think, very powerful tools to advocate for policy changes at both levels, at country level or at the more regional, provincial level. So this is the kind of healthcare system that we have in Mexico, which is kind of uh, different providers, uh, big ones, public big ones providers. But the good thing is that there is uh, popular insurance or Seguro Popular in Mexico that's covering most of the people living with HIV. So in those numbers, we had it. So that facilitated us in order to estimate the Mexican cascade of care, which I'm showing here, and which, which is also shown in one of the posters at the cascade section of the poster exhibit. So in Mexico, we have 210,000, and then the biggest drop in Mexico is from is on the diagnose, on the testing part. So we, from 100% on, on living with HIV, we dropped to 52% only on the HIV diagnose. And then the rest of the cascades goes more smoothly, more or less, but the biggest gap uh, we feel and we found is on the, on the HIV diagnose as the first uh, part. So, what we think in order to use the cascade as a powerful tool for, for, for advocacy purposes, uh, we started doing it actually here in these uh, workshops and also on the Treatment as Prevention Summit in London by comparing countries. In comparing countries' cascades, not just the developed countries, but also the developing countries. And in this case, comparing the, some developing countries, which are not that many that have their own cascades. In this case, we had information about Mexico, Argentina, uh, the USA, France, UK, Georgia. Uh, the interesting thing for us here is that after developing the Mexican cascade, which is shown here in yellow, and the USA cascade, which is shown in red, of course, there's a big difference between the ones who know their status in the US and in Mexico, 82% on the US, 52% in Mexico. But then at the end of this cascade, the barely suppressed ones were quite similar. So there is something happening in the United States and it's also something happening in Mexico, but of course, uh, the resources that we have in Mexico, they don't compare to the ones in the US. And of course, the cascade of the US is 2009, the Mexican one is 2012, but 25%, 26% of barely suppressed uh, make it too comparable. The case of Argentina, the information that we had is around 28%, which is, which means, but I'm not supposed to speak on the United States, but the standard of barely suppressed in the United States looks like Latin America. Um, I don't know if that is good or bad. Uh, <laughs> so uh, from the methods, uh, uh, from 2010,000 people living with HIV in Mexico, which was an estimation done together with UNAIDS and the National AIDS Program, we calculated the weight of each state in the national epidemic by using a composite index built with cumulative figures of AIDS cases, HIV positive diagnosis, and AIDS deaths. With this index, we then estimated the number of people living with HIV in each one of the states. Then we obtained the number of people living with HIV registered by the Minister of Health, which has a national registration, and then we calculate the percentage of coverage for each state. Finally, we obtained data from the national aid and institutional registers of people on ART by state, which is a patient by patient record that includes viral loads. And then we obtained uh, the percentage of people living with HIV who know their serological status in each one of the states. And then we started making comparisons, like the best ones in red and the worst one in red, I mean, the best ones in green, and then the worst ones in red. These comparisons are not to, to make them feel bad, but to motivate them to, to go to the green section, or at least to the blue section, which will be kind of average. So 
in the case of the data from the cascade, for example, we are doing this kind of uh, advocacy using the cascade. For example, on HIV diagnosed, the best state in Mexico is Campeche, which is a certain state bordered with Guatemala. The worst one is Coahuila, which is a northern state bordered with the US. In the case of retain in care, the best one is Aguascalientes, which is in the center part of Mexico. The worst one is Sonora, also in the border with the United States. And, and uh, on, on ART, also the best one is Jalisco, where the tequila comes from, which is central part of Mexico. And the worst one is also another one with border with the United States. I don't know what is happening in the border with the United States, but we usually get the worst indicators from there. <laughs> um, but that's Mexican responsibility. I'm not saying anything about the US. <laughs> In conclusions, uh, the HIV diagnosed rates at the national and state levels are known, uh, are known now, uh, which were not just a few months ago. The national figure of 52% of the ones diagnosed is low compared to the US, 82% and France, uh, 81%. However, in terms of viral load suppression, 26% of all of all the people living with HIV in the country, similar to the US, which is 25% by 2009 uh, figures, but still far from France, like, which is 52%. Inside Mexico, variations are also valuable for advocacy purposes, mainly because except, exception made with national ARB's procurement, which is a kind of centralized uh, thing, all the other decisions on almost each single state, which are 32 of them, uh, on each part of the cascade are on the hands of the state level authorities. That's why we need to compare them. With preliminary results, we already started advocating for policy changes inside Mexico. Uh, as part of our recommendation, we really believe that all countries should develop their own cascades of care. They are good tools for programming and monitoring. We strongly encourage to do comparisons, either between countries or at the state provincial level or even at more local levels like hospital or clinic level. Comparisons are not to punish authorities uh, who are the decision makers, but to motivate them. The Mexican Cascade of Care, together with the new WHO ART guidelines, from, uh, 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 were the main two drivers to start working on the modification of the Mexican ART guidelines, which are likely to be announced next month, uh, will, and they will be announced the moving from 350 to 500, including ART to all positive partners of several Gordon couples. So I just want to thank my co-authors, Carlos Magis and Enrique Bravo, also to Patricia Uribe and Carlos Del Rio for agreeing to work with us on the Mexican Cascade paper to be published soon, to Michael Weinstein for securing the fundings to work on this issue. And finally, an announcement. Uh, AHF, together with uh, IAPAC, uh, PAHO, UNAIDS, and the governments of Mexico and Brazil, are copying Julio Montaner's idea to have these kinds of treatment as prevention workshop but now we are going regional, and, and um, so we are having our first regional treatment as prevention workshop. We are not calling it workshop, just make Julio not to steal the complete idea of the name. Uh, and he accepted to be one of the speakers as well, uh, Carlos Del Rio, who's also here. So we will have it uh, next month, May 25 to 28. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>